Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast for the foreign policy and global development communities and anyone who wants a deeper understanding of what is driving events in the world today. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch. Enjoy the show. The process by which China makes its foreign policy is often considered to be something of a black box, or at least very difficult for outsiders to discern. The head of the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, is the ultimate decision maker. But as in any government, there are also various bureaucracies with their own and sometimes competing interests. Suixing Zhao is a professor of international studies and director of the Center for China-U.S. Cooperation at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver. He is a scholar who has written extensively about the bureaucratic politics that helps shape Chinese foreign policy and the broader tapestry of Chinese institutions that inform foreign policy decision-making. In our conversation, we kick off discussing the role of the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, in a recent decision to send an unprecedented number of fighter planes to the periphery of Taiwan's airspace. We then discuss the implications of the fact that Xi Jinping has been able to centralize foreign policy decision-making to a far greater degree than his predecessors Hu Jintao and Zhang Zemin. I have long wanted to do an episode that helps listeners better understand the process and institutions that help shape Chinese foreign policy. I think you'll find this conversation very helpful. I know I did. Please let me know what you think about this episode. You can reach me using the contact button on globaldispatchespodcast.com or by hitting me up on Twitter at Mark L. Goldberg. I love hearing from you. Please reach out. Let me know what's on your mind. All right, now here is my conversation with Suixing Zhao of the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver. As we speak, China is sending an unprecedented number of fighter planes to the periphery of Taiwan's airspace and inside what Taiwan considers its air defense identification zone. Could you perhaps help listeners understand the decision making process that? leads to an outcome like this? Like, What would have been the key institutions involved in deciding that now is a good time to be sending a whole bunch of fighter planes to Taiwan's near airspace? On the national security policy making, like uh, sending uh, fat jets to the Taiwan Street is uh, the decision made finally by the Central Military Commission headed by the CCP uh, chairman, Xi Jinping. And there are many players here but mostly, most importantly here, the players are the PLA, the military. And the military has a very powerful voice uh, in the foreign policy and the security policy making process. Uh, but for many years, uh, the military uh, had uh, its own somehow, I will not say independent, but uh, somehow unchecked powers before Xi Jinping. And the civilian leaders uh, did not have much control over that, such as uh, Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin years. For example, 2011, uh, when Robert Gates, the U.S. Secretary of Defense, visited China, the military uh, launched a stealth uh, jet fighter uh, to send messages to the United States, which uh, the civilian leaders did not uh, like it. But uh, Hu Jintao was not informed. So Xi Jinping has determined now to make control of the military. In fact, uh, after he came to office, he launched uh, the anti-corruption campaign. Although this campaign was very widely uh, covered, but uh, he in fact purged two vice chairmen of the CMC, the Central Military uh, Commission, uh, Guo Bo Xiong and uh, Xu Cai Hou. Both were appointed by uh, Hu Jintao. Mm. And uh, since then, 
he has pretty much uh, asserted his authority over the military. The kind of shenanigans uh, that the uh, PLA pulled during the previous administrations in which they acted with far more independence and sometimes did so in a way that embarrassed the civilian leadership, as the example of the dispatching fighter jets during Robert Gates's visit Visit, demonstrated, that, that would never happen today because of Xi Jinping's centralization of this process. On the other hand, because uh, Xi Jinping's uh, policy and his own visions now shared by the military. Mm. And uh, therefore, uh, they have come to a somehow consensus on many policy making issues. Uh, for example, during that period, uh, the PIA would not uh, be able to send the jet fighters to the Tiananmen Street because uh, Hu Jintao, even Jiang Zemin tried to emphasize so-called the peaceful unification. And uh, even the South China Sea, those uh, island construction, in fact, uh, the military pushed very hard mm. to Hu Jintao before 2013, before Xi Jinping came to office, uh, to uh, construct those um, man-made artificial islands. Xi Jinping, well, uh, Hu Jintao uh, uh, suppressed that, did not mm. allow that. There was tension between military and the uh, civilian leadership. Uh, Xi Jinping came to office, he just uh, not only uh, agreed to his, his, his own idea to take Taiwan back uh, mm-hmm. uh, by force, uh, if necessary. And this has been the China policy for a long time, but Xi Jinping has uh, somehow set this as uh, his mission to uh, un- un- unify, so-called unify, uh, Taiwan hmm. uh, by force. He is sort of joined yeah. in that vision by the PLA who share that vision. Right. Hmm. The PLA has pushed that. Uh, hmm. Hu Jintao has, uh, Hu Jintao did not uh, uh, want to carry that, agree with that. Hmm. Now, uh, Xi Jinping has not only endorsed that, uh, but uh, pushed that forward uh, hmm. further. So that's what we see now. Uh, I, th- this question on on the PLA, I have seen you write and emphasize that the PLA is best understood as an armed wing of the Chinese Communist Party as opposed to the military of the state of China. Why is that a meaningful distinction? In China, uh, the leadership, uh, the Communist Party came to power by the barrel of gun. So for the uh, Communist Party leaders, the control of the military is always fundamental for them to maintain the regime security. So from very early years of uh, the founding of PRC, and the military has under has been under the direct and uh, control of uh, the Communist Party. After the founding of the PRC, they had made very clear that uh, the PLA is not a state army. It's the party's army. The CMC, the Central Commission, Central Military Commission, has been some kind of a bridge between the civilian leadership and the military leadership. The chairman is always the Commerce Party General Secretary or chairman, number one person. And uh, the members, the vice chairman, are from the military and very often handpicked by the chairman, by the CCP uh, 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 general secretary. So the CCP has, in that kind of institutional setting, uh, controlled the military. The state council, which is the executive branch of the government, has no authority over the military. Give you an example. 2008, when there was an earthquake uh, in Sichuan province, Wenchuan earthquake, the premier at that time was Wen Jiabao. He went to the earthquake uh, site uh, right away and uh, tried to order (laughs) to uh, uh, ask the military to uh, dispatch, to send troops to help. But the commander told him, no, you cannot... uh, 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 command us, you know, the, the command has to come from the Central Military Commission. He's not a member of that. So the mm-hmm. command had 
to come from the general secretary of the CCP. So CCP has always in control of the military. So in this case, in the South China Sea, in the uh, East China Sea, and also on the Taiwan Street, uh, um, those contentions, uh, the military will not be able to do anything without the chairman of the CCP, in this case, uh, General Secretary, uh, Xi Jinping's authorization. So that's what we see the direct control of the military. In fact, uh, even on the foreign policy front, the CCP has also direct control of the foreign policy making. In fact, when founding of the PRC in 1949, Zhou Enlai, he was the uh, premier. He was concurrently also the foreign minister. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the day of the founding of the foreign ministry, he took the uh, Chinese diplomats, you are the PLA in plain clothes. Uh -huh. Civilian PLA, exactly. Very strict discipline. Yeah. Very huh. strict discipline under the CCP. The, the key here in the foreign policy making process in China has been so called consensus building. All those stakeholders, all those players uh, normally are presented, I mean, at, at the very top level, presented in those ad hoc leadership small group. Uh, in this case, these small groups are also have also been headed by the general secretary of the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. And uh, both Jiang Zemin and uh, Hu Jintao had that. Now Xi Jinping has reorganized uh, uh, the foreign policy uh, small leadership uh, group, upgraded that mm -hmm. into so-called uh, foreign policy, uh, central foreign policy uh, commission. I wanted to ask you about the significance of that move in 2018 by Xi Jinping to uh, upgrade what were previously called these leading small groups uh, that would make discrete areas of, of Chinese foreign policy into this kind of centralized and, and almost upgraded foreign affairs commission. Like, What was the significance of that 2018 bureaucratic reshuffle? Yeah, this has to go back to uh, 2014, uh, when Xi Jinping tried to have a holistic uh, national security making uh, mechanism. When Xi Jinping came to office, he wanted to in reinforce uh, national security and foreign policy making capacities of the Communist Party. So the one thing he did 2014 was uh, to establish what uh, he called the Central National Security Commission. When that commission was established, it's very kind of a mysterious. Uh, they had only two meetings, 2014, 2018. I paid attention, I tried to find all those information. Some, they listed 11 uh, areas, uh, including uh, what I paid attention, I think was very interesting, was uh, political security. So called political security is uh, another term for regime security. security. Of course, yeah. And uh, so that commission has combined both internal security and external security together. Hmm. Over years, I thought when it was established, were kind of uh, when they say holistic security, I thought it will have a lot of components of uh, 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 external security. Indeed, their external security intelligence and anti, uh, anti intelligence, all those things are part of that. But more and more, it has uh, 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 linked to domestic security. Mm -hmm. So in that context, uh, the leadership, I think Xi Jinping himself uh, decided he has to reorganize the external security and foreign policy making uh, institutions. So that's what you talked about 2018. The hmm. foreign affairs, uh, central foreign affairs uh, leadership group was upgraded into the central foreign affairs commission. And uh, this is not only headed by himself, uh, Xi Jinping as the uh, leader, and uh, also 
And the deputy leader was a premier, Li Keqiang uh, himself, very powerful. This never had those kind of foreign affairs like institutions at that high level. Then they set up another office called the uh, uh, Central Foreign Affairs Commission Office, headed by Politburo member. You know, I am like a, a firm believer that uh, people generally discount the role of bureaucracy in foreign policy making. And so the reason I'm, I'm really interested in, in speaking with you is to, you know, get into the weeds a little bit and, and learn um, what are some of the key institutions that contribute to foreign policy, uh, but also learn what risks uh, are associated with China's unique bureaucratic uh, setup and how the current bureaucratic structure of Chinese foreign policy might lead to mistakes as well. Okay, here, uh, talking about the foreign policy making uh, uh, system in China, we talk about several layers. Uh, At the top, of course, is the paramount leaders uh, like Xi Jinping, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, Deng Xiaoping, Mao Zedong, those uh, leaders. Uh, uh, some of them have a more centralized authorities than others, uh, but uh, they are always at the very top. But they have uh, rely upon bureaucracy, they rely upon what they call policy consultation and the coordination institutions. So the second level is the, those uh, central policy coordination and the consultation institutions, small leadership group, now they call commissions. Uh, uh, and the third level uh, are the bureaucracies. Uh, uh, in the bureaucracy level, I see three uh, categories, three types of bureaucracy. Uh, state bureaucracy, uh, like a foreign ministry, foreign trade, uh, Bank of China, and the finance ministry now got into, and uh, uh, many other uh, I mean, immigration, national secu- uh, state security, uh, ministry, all those kind of state bureaucracy. Then is another part is a very unique Chinese called the party diplomacy institutions, central uh, committee. The on them they have, for example, uh, the central liaison department. Sometimes they also call central international uh, department, and also central propaganda department. The are in, I mean, uh, central liaison department is in charge of working with foreign political parties. It used to be only communist parties. Now they have a broad parties. They just uh, had uh, early this year. They called the the, the political party summit, uh, which has uh, 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 how many parties? Uh, more than uh, hundred uh, nations uh, involved, uh, and many heads of state and party parties. Uh, and uh, that function is different from uh, the state uh, diplomacy. State diplomacy is uh, representing the state, the government. Here is what they can supplement to the state diplomacy, which is to, is to tell the Chinese story, to, is to, have, to correct the misperceptions of China by foreign political mm-hmm. elites, foreign uh, governments. And uh, then the central propaganda department uh, they also control all, all the media uh, to um, uh, uh, to make those uh, so-called soft power uh, mm-hmm. over uh, over the world. Then another very important department I think the United States have uh, paid attention to is the Central United Front and Department. Uh, they try to work with those uh, overseas Chinese uh, um, uh, uh, foreigners. Uh, I mean those uh, Chinese origins in the foreign countries and also uh, some kind of elite organizations, even the foreigners, uh, try to uh, help to use them as in- instruments uh, mm. uh, to spread uh, China's uh, international uh, influence. And third part of the, uh, and the, 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 the bureaucratic d- diplomacy is uh, military, so-called the military diplomacy. Uh, here is uh, uh, coordinated by the Central Military Commission. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, uh, and there is a very powerful institution there. They call the uh, Military Foreign Affairs uh, Office. Uh, used to be uh, under the um, only under the military defense department, defense ministry. But Xi Jinping has upgraded that also now, uh, directly on the CMC Central Military uh, Commission. So. These are the three parts of uh, 
uh, bureaucratic uh, uh, diplomacy. Under that, that's a new development. These three layers are what we see very formal institutional uh, setting. Uh, they are re- kind of emergence now. I think emerging new players uh, have occurred. Four types of players, I think, what I have paid attention to. One is so-called uh, foreign policy think tanks. Mm. This is a very new term in China. I saw that only in the last 20 years, 10, 20 years. There were some kind of uh, res- foreign policy research institutions uh, since 1949, but they were most kind of de- ideological. Uh, doing those kind of ideological research, not empirical research, policy consultation advice. But now years, in the last 20 years, those uh, foreign policy think tanks have emerged very powerful to influence foreign policy uh, making. And most of them on the auspices of uh, the, the government's party. And some of them in uh, academia, but uh, they make their names by making policy recommendations adopted. Hmm. Um, by the government. The second uh, new group I see is uh, those uh, informed uh, netizens, uh, those uh, public. And uh, because China now become a big power, the public become more and more in, uh, interested uh, uh, in the foreign policy uh, issues and try to express themselves. And not only those uh, sensational uh, newspapers like Global Times, and they have become a place to impress those kind of uh, so-called public opinions of China. Also, Internet uh, uh, have uh, provided the forum for them to talk about those issues. The central leadership in the past, the Hu Jintao years, were somehow hijacked by them. But now Xi Jinping has used them uh, for his own foreign policy objectives. The third group, uh, and those kind of, uh, it's a local governments. I really find local governments now play more and more important uh, role. There was an article I published in my journal called Local Liberalism. Um, basically, those uh, local governments, although their function is to, uh, to pursue so-called economic and the cultural exchanges, but somehow, and very often, they have influenced China foreign policy making, for example, in South China, Guangxi province, and uh, they are very, they are bordered with the uh, Southeast Asian countries, especially those continental three countries. And uh, they have uh, become a hub uh, for China to, uh, uh, to bring those Southeast Asian countries into orbit, Chinese economic and strategic interests. And Shandong province, also South Korea. I mean, China, when China, um, built the uh, relationship with China, South Korea in 1990s. Uh, I think both Liaoning province and uh, Shandong province, they competed to invite delegations mm. and really facilitate, facilitate that process. And also the central government used them for those uh, as a leverage. And the fourth group, I would say China's transnational corporations, uh, oil, mm-hmm. financial, and now the high tech. Uh, I mean, in last month, we see this was is unfolding. And this month, uh, the, the Huawei uh, 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 executive, uh, Meng Wanzhou yeah. event, it's a very classical example now how the China transnational corporations have uh, uh, influenced foreign policy making. In fact, the uh, US, China, uh, uh, Canada, China US relationship has somehow hijacked by this corporational, hmm. I mean, companies' interests. They arrested two Canadians as hostage yeah. <laughs> just for one uh, yeah. executive from a Chinese uh, giant, Huawei. So, so these are four uh, uh, unconventional groups. So Chinese foreign policy making, very often people say, uh, oh, China is authoritarian. It's authoritarian, but it's very complicated. Just mm-hmm. like Washington. I would say China is just much like Washington. So many players and so complicated process. Uh, but still, I would say in Xi Jinping's years so far, uh, the top leadership, the paramount leader, uh, Xi Jinping, he has somehow uh, in full control of the foreign policy process. In fact, all the institutions, what I ca- talked about, all those players, they try to win the ear of Xi Jinping, one person. 
mm-hmm. just one person. And that presents a degree of risk as well. Like you are funneling information up in order to win the ear of the one person who makes the decision. Yet I think by virtue of that, you are probably selective of the information that you are um, pushing up to that one person, not giving that one person like a full spectrum of information from which to make a decision. Uh, it's not like a competitive process in, in, in a way. Uh, and therefore, the chances of mistakes seem kind of high. Especially when you're talking about like a high stakes situation, like we're talking about now in, in in Taiwan with all these fighter jets, you know, it seems like we're you know one mistake away from something calamitous happening. Exactly, that's a point. It's a competitive process. Uh, each type of intuition, so all players they wanted to present their interests as the top uh, overall interest of China. And also, they very often selectively present their information to the top leadership. Uh, so in that case, every step of the decision making by Xi Jinping himself could be flawed. And uh, uh, these kind of flaws cannot be corrected easily. Um, because uh, nobody would want to tell Xi Jinping, this is wrong, their information is wrong. It's a competitive process, but they all want to see they are correct. But they cannot tell the leader what's going wrong. And every also those information providers also provide what the leaders want to listen, will not tell him what he did not want to listen. So this is a very dangerous process. If there is a wrong decision made, cannot be corrected. And uh, they are what I call intended and unintended consequences uh, and come to the no return, like the Taiwan Street. If Xi Jinping decided we would launch and they would use force to so-called liberate you uh, to unify with Taiwan. No can, nobody can stop him. That could be a disaster for China, for the region, and for the world. So by personalizing the decision-making process, Xi Jinping really made China's foreign policy making process uh, very arbitrary and very dangerous. Well, can I ask you, in theory, I mean, if Joe Biden wanted to attack China in defense of Taiwan, it's his sole decision to make. It's his sole discretion. Uh, But presumably there are stronger institutions here in the United States that would hold him back from doing so and from making a disastrous decision like that? Is that sort of what you're suggesting? Yes. Uh, the, the, of course, uh, the U.S. president is a commander-in-chief, for sure. But we, we, we saw the Trump last month, the, the military is uh, neutral. It's not a party's military. And the bureaucracy, and the, even under Trump, I don't think he could easily launch a war like this. Uh, there's a check and balances here in the Congress. Uh, uh, in the bureaucracy, every, everywhere, uh, could uh, somehow uh, uh, slow or delay or even stop very, very dangerous decision. But in China, cannot do it. There's no way to stop him. And even Xi Jinping, today he makes his mind. Everyone was like, great idea. How smart you are. And on the military adventures, the military, I think, They are ready. They are really ready. Although I don't think they are uh, uh, logistically ready, but that's their, they thought that's their opportunities to win for the journal's promotion and uh, for the home military get more resources. And especially nowadays, you saw during this uh, National Day holidays, the most hot movie is the... uh, Korean Wall movie, which I think is because Chang Jin Hu, I was so amazed by this uh, movie. It's a, a highest um, uh, uh, office, uh, post, I mean the, uh, and the 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 sale uh, in the movies in the theaters. The villains are Americans. Yeah, that's exactly. People yeah. saw this that the, them to set to serve the country, 
I mean, they, they did not have the idea how cruel, how disastrous a wall would be. They yeah. thought it was a chaotic movement yeah. for China. So there's a propaganda, this type of a bureaucratic setting, institutional uh, arrangement, that is so difficult to correct those flaws and to stop the wrong decisions by Xi Jinping. It's a very dangerous situation. I'm really concerned. I'm concerned both countries, the United States has a lot of problems, but it's not the time to talk about the United States. But China, I'm really, really concerned now the direction China has gone into. The whole nation is so nationalistic. I'm, I just wrote an article for the Washington Quarterly. I think they will run that uh, late this year, early next year. The title is uh, From uh, Affirmative Nationalism to Combative Nationalism. The Chinese nationalistic feelings is ready to combat against any foreign powers to stop any foreign criticisms of China. And the and bureaucratic so incentives, this- as you said, are, are, are there, as you said earlier, like the propaganda department has a bureaucratic incentive to whip up nationalism. The military has a bureaucratic incentive to want to uh, unify, quote unquote, Taiwan. They'll get more resources. Uh, and, and that seems to be like a key danger at the moment. Yeah. And uh, for Xi Jinping, in his way to control military is very different from the previous leaders. Mm. Uh, he has emphasized the military uh, should be ready to fight and win the fight battles and win those battles. He restructured the military uh, through uh, in, in 2014 and uh, into what they, he called kind of a battle, uh, 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 battle combat ready military. And uh, so this military now, uh, they have a much more advanced weaponry, although it's still not uh, up to the U- U.S. Uh, standard. I thought that they, they have uh, lethal weapons, especially uh, nearby their home I mean, in Taiwan Street of South China Sea. It's far from the United States. It's very close to China. They think they can win. They really think they can win. Now, they, are, they think if uh, the uh, spring leader Xi Jinping issue the order. They're ready to carry out. I don't know if they are really ready, but they think they are. They can win the battle. They can destroy all the U.S. Uh, uh, aircraft carriers, uh, even those uh, base in Guam, in Japan, in South Korea. They talk about that. And uh, in Australia, they said now the Australia, U.S., U.K., this uh, uh, AUKUS, uh, three-country nuclear submarine deal, brought uh, Australia into the target of the Chinese nuclear weapons. That's what they talked about. So the Ch- Chinese now side is so offensive. They used to be very defensive, uh, very reactive, but now they are proactive. Mm-hmm. They are the, the incentives somehow, are aligned right now for, for yeah, being yeah, proactive. Yeah, the incentive structure has changed entirely changed. So this type of decision-making environment and institutional setting has uh, made the Chinese foreign policy, national security policy toward a direction which I think international community should be very concerned. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time. We'll, we'll leave it there. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, big thank you to Suixing Zhao. That was very helpful. And though I can nearly see the Joseph Corbell School from my house, in fact, I came to Suixing Zhao because of a contribution he made in a book called China and the World, edited by David Shambaugh. This is a, an edited academic text that examines various aspects of Chinese foreign policy. I found Xu Xing Zhao's contribution to this book extremely interesting, and I'm glad to be able to reach out to him and glad he was so available to speak with me. And one last note, uh, today's episode was produced in partnership with the Carnegie Corporation of New York, and the views and opinions expressed in this conversation belong solely to those of us who expressed said views and opinion. All right, we'll see you next time. Bye.